In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the fair alarm to measure part if you have a cab model. So you need to use a cab model if you want to find the true position of a hole, or you want to use a cab model if you're going to be measuring multiple parts. You can set the cab model up once, and then all you do is measure your part and save as, and then measure a new part and then save as. So uh, before I go with the fair alarm itself, I need to open up SolidWorks and save the CAD model as a parasolid, a .x underscore t type file. I'll show you that here in a few seconds. Uh, but assuming you've already saved your file as a parasolid, uh, you're going to come in here and we're going to set the machine up first while we're getting ready. When I turn the machine on, it's going to go through a few lights here. Uh, once the light turns blue and starts blinking, I need to re-reference all the encoders. So usually I just spin it around once. And then you just need to move all the encoders around. So if you open it and then just swing everything, it should go solid blue. Once it's blue, that means you're ready to start measuring. Um, if it ever turns red, that means you've locked out one of the encoders. So here, it's red. It won't let me measure. All you have to do is just reposition the arm, and you can begin taking measurements. I'll go into more of the measurements in a few minutes, but basically the green button takes a point. Once you've gathered all the points from that surface, you use the red button and you uh, move on to the next point. So now I'll show you the parasolid file and then we'll jump into CAM2. So before I jump into CAM2, here is a parasolid file. You'll need this before you open CAM2. Uh, CAM2 here is what it looks like on your desktop. The full name is CAM2 Measure 10. So that's the name of the program. I've already opened it because it's kind of a slow program to open up. Once I've saved my file as a parasolid, I can go to a new, I'm going to open up a new uh, document which I have here, go to import CAD. You can save the parasolid in your home drive and then navigate to that. So you don't need to email yourself or use a thumb drive. You can just jump straight to your file. I'm going to import this CAD model. When you import a CAD model into CAM2, it basically just gives you a framework to work around. It doesn't know anything about the part. It just sees there is something here. It doesn't know what you want to measure or any of the links or anything. So you have to, it's a bit of a slow process to set up, um, but I have to click pick from CAD, click automatic, and then start selecting your surfaces. It's a good idea to select them in some logical order. So I know when I'm measuring it, I'm probably gonna wanna measure this surface before I measure that surface. If you click them out of order, you can just move them and drag them in place, and then you can rename them all later. So I'm going to go through and click all the features I'm going to measure. And I'm just going to capture, uh, I'll just capture just that cylinder. So I'm going to measure the length, the width of the part, and then I'll measure that cylinder right here. Now that I have everything captured, I'm going to rename them all. So now that I've renamed all the features, um, I'm going to go and add the actual measurement. So again, I've identified these planes and cylinders that I want to measure, but CAM2 doesn't really know what they are or any lengths about them, so I have to go through and measure them all. Uh, as another note, I could have again selected all these other features I wanted or given the names. I could have called cylinder 1 like the guide pin hole, but for just leaving it the same, I left it as uh, cylinder 1. So I've selected all the features I wish to measure. I'm going to click on the Construct tab. And then you have to tell it the length of everything. So I'm going to click length from features to measure them. Now I want to know the length of the part, which would be the short side to the short side. And that's going to be the length. And as a side note, you can hover your mouse over the features and it will light them up so you can figure out what the name of each one is. I'm going to measure the width now, long side to long side. I'm now going to measure the length from the long side to the cylinder. And then my nomenclature here, my primary datums are long side primary and short side primary. The other one I just called long side alt, so the alternate long side. Um, you can name them whatever you want. You can name them the datums if you wanted to. Um, you can give them more descriptive or less descriptive names. but. It's helpful to give them a descriptive name so the operator knows what they're measuring or what they're supposed to be measuring because it will prompt you the name. So long side to C1, did I create that? Nope. Uh, short side to C1, short side primary. And I may also want to know the angle 
So I'll do the angle from the primary sides. And then I may also want to know the angle from the top jaw to the cylinder. Oops. So now I've identified all the parts. I've identified the length or the measurement that I want to, uh, that I care about with that part. So I click on here. I can see that it's supposed to be five inches three inches and then the cylinder is supposed to be 0.625 from the long side 2.375 from the short side and then I can see the angle between the long side and short side and the angle or the perpendicularity of that guide pin should be 90 degrees uh, now that I have everything in here I can go through and adjust the tolerances so I can change all the tolerances individually or if you're going to change multiple tolerances at once you can click preferences go to tolerance and then I can change individual ones, um, each one individually, so I can change this from eight thousandths to nine thousandths if I wanted. Apply all, press OK, and I could also change something like the perpendicularity. I'll go to six thousandths on that, and then maybe I'll change the parallelism to six thousandths as well. And these are just arbitrary numbers I'm making up. Now that I've done that, if I click on the width, I can see that the new tolerance is now nine thousandths versus eight thousandths. And then at this stage, I'm now ready to begin measurements. I have to take the measurements before I can apply the GD&T callouts. Now that I have all the features identified, the dimensions of all the features I want to measure, I'm first going to save it. Sometimes it'll hold up on you. So I'm gonna save as, save it in some logical location. And I'll just call this vice. And I'm going to say T1 for the template. I'll just call it Vice T for the template. And now before I measure it, I'm going to then save as, and this is just a workflow thing that I do. You don't necessarily have to do it this way. M1 is going to be the measurement one. This is my first set of measurements on this part. So I'm going to save it. And now I'm ready to actually start measuring the parts. I can hit Shift All, or Shift A, sorry. Um, and that will open up the measurements and it may prompt you to switch from um, template mode to measurement mode, but if I hit Shift A, it'll say, are you ready to start measuring? And it'll actually highlight the feature that it wants me to measure first, and it highlights it over here. So it gives me the name, and it highlights it over here. Now that I have everything set up on the software side, I'll begin taking measurements. Um, sometimes this will act as a mouse for the screen, so if you see things happening over there, I'm sorry. Let's try to keep it to a minimum. There we go. Uh, again, green button takes a measurement, red button moves to the next page. Uh, when you take the measurements, you want to get at least 7 for a flat plane and 13 for a cylinder. So for most of these, I'll get at least 7. The more you get, the more accurate it'll be. Um, once you've finished taking a measurement, you need to back up off of the surface that you're measuring and press the red button. You need to move about a half inch to one inch away from the surface. And this is called compensating away. You want to compensate for the ball diameter. It needs to know which side the measurements we're taking on and such. So. I'll measure this flat plane, I'll move up, hit the red button, and then it'll end that measurement session. When you're pressing the green button, you want to make sure that the arm itself isn't swaying or moving. You also don't want to be moving the arm while you're taking measurements. It is tempting to just drag it along and tap the button a bunch, but that's not the most accurate way. So the most repeatable way to do it is to come in slowly, touch the surface, completely stationary, then press the green button. You don't want to drag the ball along the surface here. It can damage the little ceramic ball. It is very delicate. You also want to make sure you're not bumping into things with a ceramic ball. It, again, it's very delicate. So we're going to tap it on there very lightly, press the green button. And then you can see I'm moving around kind of randomly so I don't pick up any um, exaggerated errors or I don't pick up only a clean spot and not miss or miss um, defects. So moving around randomly, picking up about a half inch, press the red button. It should change over here and it tells me what to measure next. It'll highlight it on the screen. I know in this case that this side facing you is the next datum. So I'll measure the rest of these and then we'll jump back in.
So now that I've measured uh, the four sides and the, the one on top, and I click the red button again, it prompts me to measure the cylinder. Now that I have the cylinder, I want to get at least, if I haven't said it already, um, 13 for the cylinder one, 13 measurement points, um, 7 for flat plane, 13 for cylinder. I'm going to basically put the probe in the bottom, measure around the bottom circumference, measure around the top circumference, and then a few random points in the middle. Now that I have all my measurement points, I'm going to switch over to just the hand tune software and start processing the data. Now that I've finished all my measurement data, um, you can see here the actual and nominal values for all the parts. You can also see which features are in and out of tolerance. Before I go looking into that, it's important that I first um, align my CAD or align my measurement cloud to my CAD model. If I zoom out enough, you can see these two aren't aligned. So I'm going to click on alignments, three feature alignment, and then usually plain, plain, plain is good enough. So I'm clicking it in the order of the datums. Um, the most important datum will be lined up perfectly with the CAD model. And then the error of the flatness or any perpendicularity issues that you have um, will kind of come out after that. So whatever one is the most important you would have as the primary. The secondary is going to have like flatness issues, for example. And then you have to try to line up those flatness issue errors with then the third datum. So I'm going to hit apply. In this case, I have three or four thousandths worth of error, which is fine. With wood, you'll often have around ten thousandths. Um, you can hold ten thousandths with wood. It's pretty easy. Um, Twenty or thirty thousandths is kind of rough. You can probably get better than that. Now that I have everything aligned, if I click on these, um, some of the numbers make a little more sense. So this is supposed to be five inches long. You can see here it's out of tolerance by thirty thousandths. And then you can see it's below the deviation from the tolerance is three thousand uh, thirty nine thousandths so I can see here's the actual value here's how far it is from the target value the deviation and the out of tolerance is how far it is beyond the specified tolerance in this case of nine thousandths and you can do that for each one of the features that you have selected I can do that for the angle here and then I have to click and add my GD&T tolerances afterwards so I'm going to click include features I'm going to include everything, click add, and then I'm going to go through and assign my datums. So now I want to know, we will do the true position of the cylinder, the maximum material condition from A, B, and C. So this shows us the true position of that pin is the actual deviation is 28 thousandths from the tolerance. Something I also sometimes do, something I also do, um, is sometimes I want to see just the positional tolerance. So I'll do B and C, and then you can also separate out and find the perpendicularity. So technically this true position up here includes the perpendicularity, but if you wanted to see the perpendicularity all by itself, you can do that. You have that option. Um, it might also be useful to know the perpendicularity from the short side to the long side, and then it's often, you can have other perpendicularities, and I'll show you a, uh, you can do a parallelism, we'll say long side alternate, the parallelism with the primary datum, or the secondary datum. And then when I click back to here, all of those will show up in here. So if I click on cylinder one, I can see the perpendicularity is one thousandths from what it should be. I can see the true position here. I can see the angle. All these are filled in now. And if I wanted at this point, I could generate a report. So if I want to generate a report, just click down here to make a report. Probably would have been a good idea to solve, uh, save it before I click on. So now that I have the report template open, I'm going to go all up here to ETM. Sometimes this Ohio University logo doesn't always pull in, and then other times in the document header section, not all of these tabs are selected, so you may have to do that yourself.
you also may have your own template to use, but for this example, I'm going to use the ETM template. Uh, you want to click on include features, and then you should include all the features. And then one key thing to note is whatever your last view was is what will show up right here. So if you want to change that, click on feature. And then you can change the view. Here is the zero view. And then I will click and add some labels. And I'll move these labels around. So they're easy to see. And then I'll zoom in nicely. So now when I go back to the report, it should be... So now when I go back to the report, it should be a little better. Um, you can again zoom in a little more. You can see it kind of chops off a little bit on the top and bottom from the other view. You can change the order of these just by dragging them around. So you can move all the measurements. Um, you can move all the features up. You can include extra views if you want to just by clicking back on the features tab, clicking this create folder. And then right click capture view data, so let's move it to another view. This is a terrible view, but this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to right click and go to capture view data. Now I can go back to my report. And I can click on include, and I can click this alternate view, and then drop it wherever I want it to appear in the report. So now it'll be the very next thing. So I had to go back and I had to readjust this view to make it the primary view. And then down here is the alternate view. I can click back on features. And if you want to switch between the views, you can right click and hit recall view data. It'll switch it back to that view. And then you can go back to your primary view if you want. So those are useful to save those views.